I thought that I didn't have anything else to say about the Milosevic trial and the ICTY and the um, Yugoslavian civil war and the U.S. involvement there, but I looked into one of the outstanding issues, which was the testimony or the um, questioning of Jerry Labor, who is a big wig in Human Rights Watch, which I claimed was an organ of Western oligarchy and Western influence through the um, label of human rights. She's being called to testify in the Milosevic trial, uh, which I posted because she went there for a week or something in the early 90s, and her organization, Helsinki Watch, authored some reports about it, which said that, and then she also published an editorial or, you know, an opinion piece or whatever in the New York Times that said that the United States should put sanctions on Serbia until it did whatever Bill Clinton and NATO wanted it to do. So she's totally in line with all of the Western foreign policy elites, and she's just kind of a foot soldier of them. But uh, that all goes without saying. But the most interesting part is, to me, how she talked about what she described as Serbian war propaganda. Her claims are that Milosevic and the Serbian government wanted to stir up their own population and create ethnic fear uh, or fear, fear and ethnic conflict and hatred um, against the Croats so that they could mobilize them and then carry out ethnic cleansing. So this is what she claimed. And then when Milosevic is interviewing her, he's asking her some basic questions about the history of the region, and she's evasive and she won't answer a whole lot. So now I'm going to play you a, um, two clips. One is from December the 10th, and the next one is either from the same day or the following day. First, she's being questioned by the prosecutor who's against Milosevic, and in the second clip, she's going to be questioned or cross-examined you know, by Milosevic himself. So this is going to be about seven minutes. Uh, please listen to it, and then I'm going to join you on the other side. The report. Yes, Mr. Nice. On page three, in the center of the page, but the second paragraph under the heading Positions of Serbs and Croats, in the second sentence of that second paragraph, both sides stress that the current conflict is not an ethnic conflict but the result of rabid nationalist activities by the opposite side. Each is willing to believe gruesome tales of atrocities committed by the other, but such stories can rarely be substantiated. The Serbian and Croatian press exaggerate and often misrepresent the news, exacerbating the fears of both Serbs and Croats. Apart from the fact that that was being represented to you by uh, your staff, do you have any direct experience yourself of that sort of material, either at this stage or at a later stage? I do remember being in Belgrade and seeing some very uh, slick, well-produced propaganda material about Croatian abuses against Serbs with horrendous photographs uh, that were that it turned out were not from the current conflict at all, but from the uh, fascist Croatian regime during World War II. There was a cover photograph of a man's head being severed by an axe, uh, things of that kind, which of course would inflame and horrify people. And it was only when you read the small print that you saw that it wasn't actually ha happening at that time. The we pick up on page three. Nice. I'd just like to go back to the first passage on page three and to ask uh, Ms. Labour to clarify the comment that the JNA apparently intervened in the conflict uh, without authorization from its civilian commander-in-chief, the Yugoslav presidency. That's, that's the first passage that you asked her to comment on. <clears throat> now, could she clarify that for me? 
the uh, the pattern of JNA intervention was reported over and over again to us. Uh, the Army would come in uh, ostensibly as a buffer or to st stop the violence, but uh, we received numerous reports that it sided with the Serb nationalists and uh, protected their interests. Uh, where are the um, I, I, I'm afraid I cannot tell you. What I'm particularly interested in is the uh, comment that they acted uh, that the without U authorization. Yes, I can't. I'm, I, I cannot speak to where that information came from. It's in the report. It was somehow collected by our staff who prepared the report, but without going back to the people who wrote it, I cannot tell you where they got that information, whether it was um, told to them perhaps in their interviews with the presidency, because they did meet with representatives of the presidency, or whether it was their conclusion uh, on, based on what they heard. Page necessarily by propaganda from Serbia. I'm talk when I talk about the propaganda from Serbia, I'm talking about what ordinary people were hearing. Uh, who had very little uh, access to other information. Mr. Leger, in your reports here, when you refer to the past and the independent state of Yugoslavia, uh, of Croatia, I'm sorry, you say that thousands of Serbs had been killed, as well as Jews and gypsies. That's what you say. Thousands killed, you say. Are you conscious how far you are minimizing this, speaking in thousands, when the actual state of affairs is that hundreds of thousands of people were killed? Do you differentiate between thousands and hundreds of thousands of persons killed? Several hundred thousand persons killed. How is it possible that in your reports you use this kind of formulation and say thousands killed? Well, we're talking about a period of time in history that our organization obviously did not do uh, its own independent investigations of. Um, in all of our writings, we tend to choose a minimum figure rather than a maximum figure because we always err on the side of caution. Uh, I have no doubt that there are probably m many more than uh, you know, you may very well be correct in your hundreds of thousands. I don't know the figures. But I think that when in our reports we tend not to be sensational and we try to uh, choose a lower figure rather than a higher figure. Well, did you know that just in Yasinovac itself, a concentration camp, 700,000 persons were killed? In Yasinovac alone, did you know anything about that? Predominantly Serbs, and then there were Jews and Gypsies as well, as well as some other Croats, communists, and so on. I know that horrible things happened during that period. I'm not an expert to talk about them, uh, nor is it relevant to the time frame in which that we are talking about, except to the fact that events from that period were brought up and used by the Serbian media and uh, I suspect officials in the Serbian government as well to frighten and rekindle old fears and prejudices that could not lead to the peaceful relations between the nationalities within Croatia. Very well. Fine. Now, do you consider that the Serb population after this speech with respect to the NDH, the independent state of Croatia, where hundreds of thousands of their ancestors have been killed, that after the uh, call that coincides with this, sent to the Croatian people to take up arms in order to form an independent state of Croatia, do you consider that after all that and under those circumstances the Serbs had no reason to panic? I think the Serbs probably had very good reason to panic because they were being barraged from both sides. I think that the, uh, m m there were many unfortunate statements made by the Croatian government and very uh, much encouragement coming from Serbia t 
for them to take up arms and defend themselves. I think I mentioned in my previous testimony that I've witnessed some of that propaganda, some of the propaganda materials in Belgrade. They were very uh, expensively and professionally prepared. This was not a, a handouts from some little organization, but something that had a lot of money and prestige behind it. And they were horrendous to look at, and they were preying on the fears of people in the 1990s about events that had happened 50 years before. Okay, so um, let's talk about uh, Jerry Labor's background. Her maiden name is Lidsky. Uh, Jerry Lidsky is the child of two Russian Jews who moved to the United States from Russia or Poland or, you know, whatever territory that was, whatever you want to call it at the time. She was born in the 19, 1930, about something like that. And I'm going to read you a bit of her biography that I found online. Uh, Jerry Labor's career as a human rights activist began in the 1970s after years of being a middle-class homemaker and mother. With little experience in politics or international relations, Labor was appointed a founding member of the American Association, uh, Ameri Association of American Publishers International Freedom to Publish Committee. Okay, so that sounds good, right? She's a mom. Everybody loves moms, and she was a homemaker, so she was doing her Betty Crocker stuff, I guess. So that, that's friendly. That's fun. Nothing could be wrong here, um, except that that, that biography is bullshit. Um, she actually did her undergraduate work at NYU, majoring in English and philosophy, and from there she went on to do graduate work at Columbia University and she was working uh, at the Russian Institute, um, which is also called the Harriman Institute. Avril Harriman was one of the United States oligarchs who went to Russia in 1919 to get concessions from the Soviet Union and start building up their industry. Uh, he later became the U.S. Um, diplomat to the Soviet Union after um, relations were reestablished right after Roosevelt took office. Um, Avril Harriman was always in the Soviet Union and close to the Soviet Union um, during the worst periods in its history when the most violent and evil dictators were working there. So he established a, um, uh, a department of Russia studies at Columbia University that still bears his name and he established it with the Rockefeller family so they paid for it and then he set it up this is where she did her graduate work so she wasn't exactly the homemaker with little experience in politics or international relations was she she had graduate level work in this stuff from what you would have to say would be one of the most prestigious places in the university to study such matters, particularly if you want to be associated with a foreign policy establishment in the U.S. So after she got her uh, education, she uh, went to work for another Jew uh, named Leon Grulia, or Gruliov. I'm, I'm not, I didn't see it in Cyrillic, so I don't know how to pronounce it. He was also the, children, uh, the child of two Russian Jews who moved to the United States. So we don't even have to be super hardcore anti-Semitic or criticize Jews as such to understand that we're running into ethnic problems here. There aren't that many Jews in the United States, but for some reason when we start looking at foreign policy matters that have to do with Russia, we run into a whole lot of Russian Jews. Leon Grulia uh, moved to the Soviet Union in 1939 from New York or New Jersey from the Northeast. He did not even know how to speak Russian when he moved to the Soviet Union, and he went to work for the government. So he, he went to work for the Stalinist government in 1939, um, working on an English-language newspaper for foreigners in the Soviet Union. 
Um, you might think that that's being a traitor to your country or something like that, but the United States had such good relations with the Soviet Union that I guess it wasn't really a problem. Um, when the Germans invaded Russia in 1941, um, Grulioff became, became a um, U.S. aid worker to Russia, helping distribute all of that Lend-Lease and other goods that Roosevelt was shipping over there. So food, clothing, weapons, all that kind of stuff. And by this time, Grulioff had learned to um, speak and read Russian. You know, he had three or four years to do, or a couple, two or three years to do this, so he'd figured it out by that point. Um, and he did that until 1945. So he's been in Russia from 39 to 45, working for first the Soviet government and then the U.S. government, just like that, with no problem switching over from one to the other. He even got a medal uh, from Kalinin, um, you know, some sort of Soviet medal of heroism for saving so many Soviet citizens' lives with Roosevelt's aid. He came back to the United States after the war was over and went right to work for the United States government. He was now doing the opposite of what he was doing in Russia, so instead of translating material from Russian into English, he was translating material from, um, it was going from Russian, well he's doing the same thing I guess in both places. He was making English language newspapers in Russia. When he came back uh, to the United States, he's working on a, a thing called the Current Digest of Soviet Press in which they would take all the newspapers from the Soviet Union, the main ones, Pravda, Izvestia, all that kind of stuff, and they would translate it into English for the State Department. Um, we know that um, this stuff was being used by the State Department because if you look at the uh, Foreign Relations of the United States, which is a publication that the, that they put out every year containing all their secret documents and then it gets released decades after the event in question. So you can go download all the volumes up to 1960 by this point really easily uh, and, and read you know some of the secret internal memos of the State Department. They're citing Grulioff's work. They're citing his uh, Soviet policies series and his current digest of Soviet press. So they're using, they're using his work and they were almost assuredly paying for it to be done. All these translations of newspapers, daily newspapers, weekly newspapers, that's a lot of work and um, no one except the US government is gonna be interested in English language translations of Soviet newspapers, honestly. So you know the US government was paying for it. Um, in 19, and this is, we're gonna go back to the ethnic thing here about the Jews. Uh, in the introduction to his uh, Soviet policies book from 1953, uh, Grulyov, who's the editor, he writes that after Stalin dies, of course, 1953, Stalin's dead, he says, we don't really care who takes control of the Soviet Union after Stalin. What we really want to figure out is anti-Semitism in the USSR. That's the number one issue. We need to figure out what the plight of the Jews is in Russia. Um, so while the plight of the Jews in Russia may be an important issue, it would not be the United States' first foreign policy issue in Russia. But in this book that's going to be read by all these State Department people, that's what Grulioff mentions. So let's go um, back to Jerry Labor, Jerry Lidsky. She um, worked for this guy that we've just been talking about for so long, Grulioff. She works for him, worked for him for several years. And then uh, from 1961 to 1970, she works for an organization called the Institute for Study of the USSR. This could be one of two things. It's either um, an organization of the same name that was in Munich that published all kinds of in-depth policy uh, analysis of the uh, economic and political and social analysis of what was going on in the Soviet Union, or it was the Harriman Institute at Columbia. And it's not really clear which, which that she worked for. Um, what is interesting, however, 
is both of those organizations, both the Harriman Institute and the um, Institute for Study of the USSR in Munich, were both having their books published by the same publisher in the United States. And that guy's name is Frederick Prager. Uh, Frederick Prager, once again, was a Jew. He was an Austrian Jew, and uh, he immigrated to the United States. And just like our friend Henry Kissinger, who was another Austrian Jew who immigrated to the United States, he became an intelligence officer and um, a military uh, official who was governing parts of Europe in 1945. Um, in 1950, Frederick Prager is done with Europe and he comes back to the United States and according to him, he borrowed $4,000 from some friends and managed to found a major Manhattan publishing company uh, that brought many Western readers their first uh, in-depth views of life under communism in the Soviet Union. So. What I'm trying to argue here is that Frederick Prager got his $4,000 from the U.S. State Department so that they could publish their books from the Institute for uh, Research on the Soviet Union. And Gruleoff, of course, was publishing a bunch of his stuff under Prager as well. All these folks are working for the same group, and it's the State Department. They're all Jews. They all dislike the Soviet Union very much by this point. And this is the environment that uh, Lidsky comes from. Now, I found also a clip on YouTube. She's still hanging around uh, the Harriman Institute as late as 2018. She's still alive. She's got to be, you know, in her mid to late 80s by this point. But she's still hanging around. And um, she has published some material uh, specifically dealing with, okay, well, no, we're, we're not going to talk about that. What we are going to talk about is um, her assistant, just to kind of fill out this story a little bit more. And I'll, I'll post a link to this as well. This individual, it's called Sarai Brockman Shoup. And this is the next generation of this same kind of process. Um, this is a LinkedIn profile, and uh, Sarai Brockman Shoup goes to Harvard University from 1984 to 1988 and studies in the Department of Russian History and Literature. Um, okay, so you think about Russia, you think about Great Russians, Little Russians, White Russians, you think about Russian people, but no, she actually wrote her thesis on Jewish hist historian and philosopher Simon Dubno, Dubnov, um, who I've read some of his work about the history of the Jews in Russia, and it's, it's useful. But um, she then goes to the University of Ann Arbor, Michigan, which I forgot to point out that a bunch of these publishers who've been associated with all this stuff I've been talking about, they're coming out of Ann Arbor as well. So there's a few locations where all this academic activity and government stuff is taking place, and Ann Arbor is another one. So after um, this woman that I'm talking about, Sarai Brockman Shoup, gets her degree from Harvard, she goes to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and she does a two-year master's degree um, on public policy in Russian and East European studies, gets that degree in 1996. Um, and she writes her master's thesis on uh, two Jewish writers and philosophers, one of whom is Martin Buber. I don't know who the other one is. Um, but in between these two things, in between Harvard and going to the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, she goes to work for Jerry Labor at Helsinki Watch, and she's her assistant from 1990 to 1992. And on her CV here, it says that she researched and wrote reports on issues in former Soviet Union, East and Central Europe, and Turkey. Participated in 1991 Moscow Human Rights Conference. So when Jerry Labor is uh, trying to get Slobodan Milosevic convicted and sentenced to life in prison, and the prosecutors are calling Jerry Labor forward to um, make Slobodan Milosevic look as bad as possible, these are the reports from which Jerry Labor is drawing. They are written at this point in Sarai Brockman Shoup's career. Um, she has a bachelor's degree from Harvard, uh, 
where she focused on Jewish studies within the Russian department. And this is exactly who was writing these reports about what was going on in Yugoslavia. People who did not know the background of the country. Miss Labor, of course, in her testimony said she doesn't really know a damn thing about Yugoslavia, but of course her assistants were very well educated in it, or maybe they weren't. We can see here that they probably were not. They didn't have formal education, formal training in that area. Um, let's move forward just a little bit more with this and then we'll be done. Um, Sarai Brockman Shoup, after working for Helsinki Watch and getting her master's degree in more Jewish studies, uh, goes to work for the Foundation for a Civil Society in Prague. And I'll be damned if that's not a Soros organization, of course. Um, and after working for George Soros, of course, you have, to, you have to dabble in economic destruction and speculation. So she goes to work as a consultant for the World Bank, um, member of design team for Russian Enterprise Housing Divestiture Project. Um, so she's probably one of those people who was looting Russia when it was collapsing. Um, then she worked as a contractor for the Ford Motor Company because, of course, human rights and uh, the World Bank and George Soros, you might as well go ahead and work for the Ford Motor Company while you're at it. And then from that point on, it's pretty much all um, Jewish nonprofits, Jewish foundations. So um, if you look at this kind of, you know, I, I selected these people basically at random just because we were talking about um, what was going on in the Milosevic trial. If you dig just a little bit, this is the kind of stuff that you find. Thank you for your time.